It's incredible how, how short one minute feels when you're having a conversation, but how long it feels when you're waiting for a bus. <clears throat> Very good. The um, message this morning that I want to share, given, uh, can we just thank our worship team as well? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, I've entitled this Hot or Not. Hot or Not. I'd like to preface this message with, I love you all. <laughs> you are dear to me. I love you. And this is as much for me as it is for you. You are very special people. So the last couple of months has been pretty, pretty, pretty cool. There's been some stuff. Um, from a church context and from seeing God move, it's been really incredible. Uh, uh, you know, we had an amazing uh, baptism service that was just just so good, watching God do what only God can do. And then um, child dedication service, again, amazing celebration and just awesome to see this whole platform filled with uh, families and young people chasing after the things of God, just like... Um, really, really cool. And a few people that uh, I, I've spoken to in between those things, you know, sort of tell, told me how, you know, those kind of services really inspire them. And this got me thinking about uh, how after we attend like a conference or, or one of those uh, special services, you know, we kind of say, oh, we feel like recharged. We feel you know, invigorated and we, we feel like we're refreshed and that, uh, you know, we kind of end up sort of saying things like our spiritual fire has been fanned into flame and, uh, you know, it, we start to think, oh, yeah, maybe I'll invite people to church. You know, this excitement level increases when we attend uh, a conference or a special church service uh, and then we start to think about inviting people to church or telling people about God. Um, but I think that that's how God wants us to be all the time, to be constantly in that peak moment, constantly ablaze, constantly excited, to have an excited expectation for what God is going to do every day. Not just because there's a conference on or not just because it's a baptism service, but every day. And recently, um, Christy and I have been talking about certain scriptures and things like that, but there was one that she brought to mind that kind of stuck and uh, kept um, sort of repeating to me, kept being drawn back to it, which I'll, I'll read in a minute. Um, but before we do that, can I just ask, as we get into the Word, um, we come every Sunday and we kind of get used to this concept of, um, you know, coming in and hearing somebody bring a sermon. Um, but it's it's powerful stuff. The Word of God is powerful. It's really, really powerful. And what we do here is significant. It changes the atmosphere. It uh, opens up opportunity for lives to be transformed. And I don't ever want us to take that lightly. So we're going to pray. But before we pray, I'm going to ask that you guys just pray for me. Just going to ask for a moment that you close your eyes and you don't have to say it out loud. You just pray for me because for me to bring the word of God, it can't be me. It has to be God. I want Holy Spirit power in order to do it. Revelation from the Lord as the heavens open. Thank you, Jesus. But if you guys could just take a moment to pray for me. Thank you, Jesus. Your favor, Lord. Your presence. Holy Spirit, thank you, Lord. Yes, Heavenly Father, thank you, Jesus. Lord, we are just so grateful for this privilege, for this opportunity. Lord, we pray that every word spoken is glorifying to you, that it draws people closer to you, Lord, that it's honouring, that it lifts your name on high, that it's not about us, but it's about you, Lord. Lord, have your way in this place. Holy Spirit, flood this place, Lord. Just rain down on us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is raining. 
I am so glad we got the roof fixed the other week, or else we'd be in trouble. So before we read the scripture uh, that I want to get into shortly, um, I wanted to do a little experiment. On the table here, if you hadn't noticed, we have uh, three coffees. Who would like one of my three coffees? We have a delightful iced coffee. We have uh, my coffee that I got this very early this morning when I got here. There's about half of it left. I drank most of it, but then it, I left it and whatnot. And then we've got a really nice, hot, fluffy, barista-made coffee. Who, who would like one of my coffees? Who would like one? Come on, come and pick one. You can have one. Come on, quick, quick. Quick, quick. Come on, come and pick one. You pick first, you take it. So there's no calories. There you go, that's right. That's right. And which coffee are you going to have? That's right, that one. Very good. That's yours. That's right. I don't know why nobody picked that one. So one of the coffees is a scrumptious, freshly made iced coffee with all the trimmings. Mmm. One of the coffees is a piping hot, barista made, froth on top, flat white, ready to go. The other one is lukewarm, tepid at best. It's not hot. And it's not cold. And nobody wants it. Why doesn't anybody want it? Lukewarm. When we look up the definition of lukewarm, it simply says a liquid or food that should be hot but comes out moder moderately warm or tepid. If we describe a person who is lukewarm, we might use words such as indifferent, Half-hearted, apathetic, unenthusiastic, uninterested, unconcerned, lackadaisical, phlegmatic, passionless, unresponsive, or limp. Just lukewarm. But none of these sound positive, do they? None of these sound like good things. None of these sound like words that we would want to be described as. And it's kind of like when... Uh, you ask your kids, for those who have teenagers, how their day at school was. If you do get a response, uh, it certainly isn't enthusiastic. It's usually something like, oh, okay, it was all right, it was okay. Or when um, my beautiful wife says, Aaron, would you like to mow the lawn? <laughs> Why would I like to mow the lawn? <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. It's not enthusiastic at all. But we need to learn how to see every situation and every task as a way to either connect with God or please Him or lead others to Him. That everything we do can be a response to our Father in Heaven. Every task, no matter how mundane. And unfortunately, the lack of enthusiasm is contagious. Picture this for a moment. You've been out of work for a while. Uh, you've been applying for jobs all over the place and, and been knocked back after knocked back. And you finally uh, you see this job, you apply for it. It sounds like the perfect fit. It looks really good. The pay is great, all of that kind of thing. You're excited about the job. The Day one comes along, you're going for your induction and you're like, yes, this is going to be awesome. I'm enthusiastic about it. Can't wait to learn all about this new company and my new role and all of that kind of thing. And you get there and you meet Bruce. And Bruce is doing your induction. And Bruce is like, oh, how you going? Oh, excited, are you? Yeah, you get over that. <laughs> Give it a day or two. You hate this place as much as me. Yeah, this is your job. Yeah. Boring as, you hate it. Pay, it's no good. The boss, bit of a jerk. You, you just hate this place. What happens? You just get deflated. 
right? We stop expecting anything to happen. It just becomes mediocre and we end up being just like everybody else. We clock on in the start of the morning. We're watching our clock for lunchtime, watching our clock to clock off again at the end of the day, race through our whole week. Our whole week's gone. We get to the weekend and we wonder what we did all week because we're just going through the motions. When we're surrounded by mediocre, it's easy to become discouraged. We stop expecting better or bigger or more. We just do what we have to do. And when it comes to church, we just attend. We can stop expecting God to even be here. We just do it all ourselves. We just run through the motions. We just come in, we clock on, we clock off. We walk in, oh yeah, cool, pastor saw me, he knows I was at church this week, tick, done. And we leave again and it doesn't impact our lives. So the scripture that I alluded to earlier, turn with me if you will in your Bibles that you all have with you, to the book of Revelation Chapter 3, verse 15 to 17 says this. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. This is a powerful piece of scripture. So let's talk about this for a second. What is Jesus saying here? What's he getting at here? Well, Jesus is uh, talking to a church uh, in a place called Laodicea. And Laodicea was a wealthy city. They were uh, known for their banking and their investments and their money and that kind of thing. Uh, they were a city of trade and resource. And they'd come to rely uh, on themselves and their own wealth. They wanted for nothing, right? They had everything that they needed. They had every earthly desire. And in fact, in 60 AD, the city was devastated by an earthquake, completely decimated by it. But rather than expecting imperial help from Rome, they pushed back and said, no, we want to rebuild our city ourselves without any outside assistance. They wouldn't allow anybody to help them. They didn't need any outside help. They didn't ask for any outside help and they didn't want any outside help. They relied on their own resources and this had become a culture of the city but it had also become the culture of the church there. They thought they had all they needed, but they had become spiritually blind. They had started to think too highly of themselves and stopped following God and relying on Him for guidance and provision. We read in this scripture that's very strong that although they were rich in material things. Spiritually, they were in a wretched and pitiful state. This is strong, strong words. This is uh, impacting. And it was made even worse by the fact that they didn't even see their own need. They couldn't see where they were. They had lost enthusiasm for God. Then Jesus goes on to say that he's about to spit them out of his mouth, to throw them up, to vomit them out. Again, powerful stuff. And it's scary if you think about what he's saying. This is such an intense and important thing, which is why Jesus is being very firm in his warning. We are called to live an abundant life above and beyond what we can dream and imagine, to live with excited expectation, with joy and peace. And all of that is from God, not our own doing. We need to rely on God to have hope and faith, to be guided by him. We need to rely 
on him in all areas of our life. The comfort that we sometimes think we have can be very worldly and very destructive. We're not created for mediocre or average or to just get by on our own strength and our own provision. We are created in his image and God is exceptional. We're created in the image of God and there is nothing mediocre about God. He is exceptional. We are created to be living, breathing carriers of Jesus, to be wells of living water and drawing people to us and drawing people to God. The interesting thing about this particular scripture and what he's talking about, about lukewarm, there's a few, um, a few sort of theories around it, um, but one of the consensuses is, the theologians say, that that particular city, Laodicea, was a very, um, like I said, wealthy city. Um, and where they sat um, geographically, um, there wasn't a heap of water around for them. And so they built these amazing aqueducts. And they would um, bring water in from uh, Heropolis, had these um, volcanic springs and this piping hot volcanic spring water um, would come in. But by the time it got... To Laodicea, it wasn't piping hot anymore, it was lukewarm. It also had a lot of mineral in it that would calcify um, and make it um, a bit hard to use. And then Colossae had um, these beautiful uh, freezing cold springs, fresh spring water, and they would bring the water from there as well. But again, by the time it got to Laodicea, it would be lukewarm tepid. So he wasn't just pulling out a phrase out of nowhere and hoping that it would land. He was making a real point about spitting it out of his mouth that he didn't want just lukewarm. He wanted it hot. And if you can't be hot, be cold. There's nowhere in the middle. There's no room for it. That's what he's trying to say. The water might have been drinkable, but it definitely wasn't refreshing. In John 4, verse 13 to 14, Jesus says, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. As believers, we're supposed to make a refreshing difference in the world to bring hope and joy as we lead the lost to Jesus. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to stand out. We're supposed to be refreshing. We're supposed to bring hope and light into the darkness. But if, unfortunately, we see a lot of lukewarm Christians, a lot of lukewarm Christianity. They're the people who come to church but never really link in. They don't serve. They don't tithe. They don't pray. And often can move from church to church so that they're always the new person and the center of attention. More about them than it is about God. Or it's people who think that church should be more about them and it should be more entertaining or the way that they want it. Or they can be people whose passion for God has burned out. The fire has gone. They've lost their sense of wonder and excitement. They've lost their sense that God is going to impact the world through them. It's lukewarm Christianity. Some people have been hurt by church or have had what seems to feel like knockback after knockback in life, where they now struggle to even see God move or even hear his voice. The fire has gone out for one reason or another. Now I know that most of us here would be thinking to ourselves that we're all fired up. We're excited about Jesus. 
We're carrying the gospel everywhere we go. That's what we're all thinking as I'm talking at the moment. We're thinking, this is for you, champ. He's talking about you. We never look at it as it's for us. But even if that is the case, if all of us in this place are on fire for God, there is a burning flame on the inside of us. We are excited and pressing in and wake up every day with, Lord, what are you going to do through me today? How can I serve you? Then I want for us to know how to keep that flame burning brightly. I want for us to never lose it, to keep it going and keep it burning white hot. I don't want anybody to ever have to ask themselves in this church or in this space whether they're hot or not I want it to be obvious who we are and we can't rely on a conference once a year or special church service to maintain our spiritual heat we should be excited and expectant and on fire for God every day excited to see what he does next in and through us amen amen Amen. Acts 2, in Acts 2, it talks about um, tongues of fire coming upon the disciples, right? Then the story goes on to tell that 3,000 were added to their number on that day. There was this enthusiasm, this excitement, this power that was on those people and it drew others to them. 3,000 believers because the people were excited, because God was moving and because they were on fire for God. Not lukewarm, they were white hot. White hot, on fire for God. Now most of us would also remember when we first got saved. Those of us who got radically saved, I got radically saved, an encounter with Jesus that transformed my life like that. And, uh, and, 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 I just want to tell everybody about Jesus. Who can relate to that? Who was like that? Then we see people, and even if you didn't have that, you grew up in a home, always knew God, you would have seen people who got radically saved and they they go out and they're telling everyone about Jesus, can't stop talking about Jesus, everything's about God, everything's about the Holy Spirit, everything's about faith. And we say things like, oh, it'll wear off. They'll calm down. It'll wear down. They'll They'll get back to neutral soon. Stop it. Stop saying that. Let's not let it wear off. Let's keep that excitement. I want to be a people that walk through the mall in Armidale and just get distracted by, hey, I wonder if that guy's going to heaven. Let's tell him about Jesus. I wonder if that girl's going to heaven. Let's tell him about Jesus. I want to be stopping and praying for people. I want to see God move. I want to be bringing the power of the miraculous everywhere I go, and I want you guys to do it too. I don't want it to wear off or simmer down or become mediocre. Let's encourage people to be crazy new Christians. Let's us be crazy new Christians with a fire burning brightly in us. Amen? Amen. Very good. We need to not let the flame go out. Don't become too distant or too familiar that you stop leading people to Jesus quick question to keep it in your mind when was the last time that you actually sat with a stranger and led them to the Lord we need to avoid becoming lukewarm we need to stay on fire for God we need to never have to ask ourselves the question am I hot or not I hear what some of you are thinking. Yeah, we know we're supposed to be on fire for God. We know that we're supposed to be out there sharing the gospel. We really want to do it, but it's hard. We don't know how. Well, I've got a few points here. I prepared a few points for this question that I knew you would ask. And these, hopefully, if we apply them, my estimate is will be life-changing. We'll keep that fire burning brightly. Are you ready? Got your pens ready. Is everyone excited? Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm excited. I'm on fire. Okay, good, 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 good. Very good. All right, number one. You have to fuel the fire. Have to fuel the fire. In Matthew 4, verse 4, it says... This is Jesus saying, he said, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word 
that comes from the mouth of God. We need to learn how to excitedly seek God through his word, through the Bible. We need to be just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. It says that their hearts were ablaze when the scriptures were explained to them. Ablaze, excited, on fire for God. See, the Bible, this book, it's an amazing book filled with all sorts of incredible things telling us who he is, how he works, how he responds, the kind of miracles that he'll do in and through us. This, this book tells us all. This is the word of God. And I know that some people in the room are going, yeah, I know, but I just like, I'm not a reader. I just say I struggle to get into it. I kind of try to read, but it's, it's like, it's almost like the, bush, the book is pushing back and it's like I fall asleep when I try to read or, or I don't understand it. Or, or I don't. We need to push through. We need to keep on pushing through, whether it's a, a different tool, use a podcast, use an audio book, use a, a Bible study, use a, an app for it, whatever it is, get the word of God into us because it's the word of God that starts to fan the flame. It's how we know who he is so we can then expect him to move in the manner in which his word tells us to. We have to get in to the book. We have to get in to the Bible. And if you really struggle with the whole reading process, like I said, there's plenty of tools for you, but just try, start off verse by verse. Right? This is going to be mind-blowing, right? Mind-blowing structure on how to read the Bible. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. Simple, right? Verse by verse, Chapter by chapter, book by book. This is how we read it. Just start off with one verse a day. Just start there. And you'll start to see Holy Spirit will recall it to mind. You'll start to be able to expect for God to move in certain ways because you will have read it. Number two, we have to fan the flame. Right? These are all going to be flame analogies if you didn't realize. You have to fan the flame. How do we do that? It's through prayer. So we all know, right, the scientists in the room know that uh, fire needs oxygen in order to burn. And prayer is the oxygen you use to fan your spiritual flame. It is a necessity. It's not an option. It is a necessity. Spending time in prayer is spending time with God in relationship with him. And the presence of God is the air that our soul requires. We need to be close to God. Oswald Chambers uh, said this beautifully. There's a quote from him that says, Prayer is the vital breath of the Christian, not the thing that makes him alive, but the evidence that he is alive. Oh, I like that. I like that. That he is actually alive. Prayer is the evidence that a Christian is alive. It is vital. Calling it oxygen or air might seem like an exaggeration, but keeping that line of communication open with God is vital to your spiritual well-being. It is vital. Number three, clear the coals. Clear the coals. Again, fireplace. If we leave rubble and debris in your fireplace, in the fire pit, it can stifle the flames and smother the fire, right? Any other fire buffs out there? I just like fire. It's good fun. Not burning people's things, just fires in fireplaces or camping, right? So what's rubble and debris? Great question. You guys are really good with the questions. Rubble and debris is unforgiveness, bitterness and sin. Unforgiveness, bitterness and sin. Don't allow unforgiveness and bitterness to cause you to grow cold. Be intentional about clearing out the stuff that's no good, repenting and turning from it, asking God for forgiveness, asking God to highlight what it is that's holding you back. What is the rubble and the debris in your life? I actually, about once a month, try and take some time and I sit, quietly on my own and I say Lord what am I holding 
What am I harboring against somebody else? What haven't I let go of? Who haven't I forgiven? What bitterness am I carrying? What things in my life aren't beneficial for my walk with you or the ministry you've called me to? How can I work on that in my life? How can I clear the coals? And if you actually make that time and say to God, help me with this, he will help you with it. He will actually help you with it. We need to clear the debris out of the way and be intentional about it. And when we do it, it will change your life. If you do one thing, you take one thing away from this message this morning, and it's once a month to spend 20 minutes with God on your own and say, Lord, am I holding any bitterness or unforgiveness? Or is there anything in my life that would be putting out my fire? And I promise you, I promise you, you'll see change. You'll see drastic change in your life. Number four, we have to gather the embers. Gather the embers. Uh, Christy and I and our kids, we live in a house that is uh, fire warmed. We don't have any other heating other than the fireplace. Um, we like the wood heater. It's kind of comforting and nice, smells good, all of that kind of thing. Not everybody's into it, but we're into it. And uh, we need, especially in wintertime in these nights, we need that fire going in order that we don't freeze in our house, otherwise it gets very cold. So in the morning, I get up early uh, and I go to the fire. So of a night, I get it all stoked up and make sure there's lots of wood in there and all of that kind of thing so it will sort of burn through the night. But in the morning I get up before Christy and the kids get up uh, to go and get the fire going so it warms the house before they get up. And I go and I open up the fire and in there will be some glowing coals left. All the wood will have burned away and there's just some glowing coals. So what I do is I gather all those glowing coals together and then I put a little bit more wood on there and all of a sudden, that fire starts burning again. You are all glowing coals. When we gather together around glowing coals, it helps get our fire burning again. When we isolate, when we withdraw, when we move off on our own, there's no chance of catching that spark. There's no chance of being ignited by the person next to you. So the best place for us to keep that fire burning bright is in faith community, is in church, is in gathering together with one another to see God move. We're created for community, not seclusion or isolation, but for togetherness. A good church family will definitely help keep your flame burning bright sharing together, ministering together, and encouraging one another to stay connected. Hebrews 10, verse 24 to 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as the day is approaching. We are created for togetherness. We need to bring the glowing coals together to keep our flame burning brightly. Number five. Is everyone with me? Yeah. Say number five. Five. Number five. Fire lighters are good. Some people say it's cheating. The fire lighting purists would say you use fire lighters, do you? Fire lighters are good. They work for this analogy. My dad taught me how to um, build a campfire and, uh, and, and a wood barbecue. Uh, my dad taught me because I didn't know how, because I'd never done it. And I needed someone to show me how. And so my dad taught me how. But I remember one time, <laughs> we, went camp we used to go camping when I was going up, the boys' trips, and uh, we would always have a big fire. And I remember this one winter, we were up north camping. Um, and what we'd do is we would set up our tents, sort of like in a big circle kind of thing with a big fire in the middle. And my dad loves fire. 
uh, loves being the guy lighting the fire. And, uh, and he's trying to get this big fire going and, uh, and, and he's trying for ages and his paper and, and, and little sticks and all of that. But he was just getting kind of just smoke really because the wood was damp. He couldn't get this fire really burning. So he did what any reasonable man would do. Uh, and he said to his 12-year-old son, he said, Aaron, go and get the jerry can off the four-wheel drive. <laughs> I said, yes, Dad. So I ran and got the jerry can from the four-wheel drive and I brought it back to him. Dad opens up the jerry can and he's like looking at the fire and there's just this sort of smoke coming from it, not much there. Um, Dad wasn't aware that in the bottom of this big pile was a little flame just trying to get started, just flickering in the bottom. And he gets the jerry can and he goes... <laughs> and it was like an atomic bomb mushroom cloud. This thing went... Boom, boom into the sky and then the flame went up the up the stream of fuel coming out of the jerry can so not only was there an atomic bomb mushroom cloud in the sky but a burning jerry can and my dad being the clever man thought I'll put it out like this <laughs> and there's just fuel spewing all over the place which was on fire all over our tents, all over our camp gear, all over everything. We're diving behind cars and like, ah, oh, stop. He finally stopped and caught his breath and kneels down. He's like this. Like this, we come out from behind the cars and trees and stuff to like this war zone, burnt tents and eskies and stuff. And he's just got a look on his face like, did I do that? Like, yes, you did that. And then everyone goes, close the lid. The flames are still coming out of the thing. Anyway, that's who taught me how to build a fire. <laughs> There's no relevance to what I'm talking about. Anyway, back to what we were saying. I needed to be taught how to build a fire. I needed someone to show me. I hadn't done it before. I hadn't experienced it before. I needed someone to show me the steps in order to build a campfire, in order to light the barbecue. You... I, we need to be taught. We need assistance. We need somebody to help us with our spiritual fire. We need guidance and help. We need mentors. We need to be discipled. We need to ask people to invest into us. Proverbs 9 verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. Spiritual mothers and fathers are essential to your Christian walk. If you have an attitude of, I know everything, I've got this, you don't. Simple. We are constantly learning and growing. We need to hitch our wagon to people who are doing well. We need to... Get around people whose fire is burning bright. We need to look for guidance. We need to look to be discipled. We have to actively seek it. You need to look for those who are walking in a way that you go, I can see God in their life and you need to get close to them and say, hey, can you show me how to do this? If we've not done it, we don't know how to do it. We need mentors and we need people discipling us. The flip side of that is that we also need to be investing into somebody. We also need to be discipling people. Um, just recently in the office, we've been doing uh, some reviews um, just to see how everybody's going in the office. Do they love your job? Can I help with anything? You know, what can we do better? Uh, and a question I like to ask is, who are you discipling? And when I ask that question to you, who are you discipling? If your response is, um, um, oh, oh, well, I catch up with, uh, with John for coffee once a month. And uh, then maybe you're not discipling somebody because discipleship is intentional. It's done on purpose. It has a, a focus and that is spiritual walk. How are you and Jesus? How's your reading? And what is God saying to you? It needs to be focused. So we need to be discipling and we need to be discipled. We need to put 
that into action. Number six, burn bright. A blazing fire can be seen from miles away. It can, we've all seen it. We go, oh, look, that fire looks like it's just over there. But it will be miles and miles away. We need to burn brightly so we can be seen as people of God. I want everyone to listen to this, to pay attention to this one. We need to worship God loudly and brightly. Sing his praises often. Talk about him. Raise your hands. Don't be self-conscious. Just be God-focused. We need to not be ashamed to say that we are children of God. We need to not be ashamed to say that we're Christians. We need to be talking about him. We need to be referencing him. We need to be asking him to be in every situation and for people around us to know that we are Christians. We need, we need that. Every now and again, I have people come up to me and say, oh, the best thing happened during the week. I've been working at the same job for 15 years, sitting next to the same person, and today uh, um, they asked me what I was doing on Sunday and I told them I'm going to church. And so today I told them about Jesus. I'm like, that's amazing. What happened to the 15 years? How, for 15 years, did that person sitting next to you not know you were a Christian? How did they not know that the power of God was dwelling in you? And it's because we get ashamed, right? I don't mean that to be condemning. I'm just saying we're self-conscious. But instead of being self-conscious, let be, let's be God-focused. Let's tell people about him, about what he's done in our lives, how he's impacted us, how he's changed things, how he's set us free, how he's broken off addiction, how he's healed us, all those things. Let's be telling people about him and burning brightly. The other thing about burning brightly, I think sometimes you guys forget that I can see you from up here. And sometimes I see people sleeping. Sometimes I see people playing games on their phone. Sometimes I see people talking to the person next to them. Sometimes I see people doing all sorts of wonderful things and not being focused on the Word of God, an opportunity to grow, to be transformed, to be changed, to be renewed. I also see people being too self-conscious and too proud to truly worship God. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? Do I look okay? How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? Oh, it was an amazing service today. I really got into the worship. How great is our God? How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? Oh, we love you, Lord. You are everything. You are the beginning and the end. You saved my life. You set me free. You're everything. Without you, I'm nothing. Nothing. We have to stop being self-conscious and be God-focused. He is everything. We need to break free from the shackles of conformity and what the world wants us to be. And Oh, I'm a strong, civilized man. And I'm in control all the time. Lose control in God. Get lost in God because I know that we're all little boys on the inside. I'm a man too. So I know what we go through, our emotions, our shortcomings, our insecurities, our desires, our hopes, our dreams. He already knows. He made you. He created you. Let go. Let loose. Be free. We're a Pentecostal church. We're supposed to be dancing and singing and praying loudly and raising our hands and cheering and worshipping our God. It's not supposed to be suppressed and down and, oh, unless you're wearing the right thing and doing the right thing and sitting the right way and blah, 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 blah. There's other churches for that. That's not this church. 
We're the church of Jesus Christ. We love God, sold out, on fire, a flame, ablaze. He's transformed our lives and renewed us. We're born again. If you were born stuffy, that's just the way you were born, all stern and stiff with a board on your back and the coat hanger still in your jacket. That's okay because now you're born again. Jesus has set you free. He's renewed you. You're a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come so we can worship him loudly. Hebrews 12, sorry about that, (laughs) verse 28 to 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Sometimes we get confused and we think that reverence and awe is stiff. (laughs) Reverence and awe doesn't have to be like that. Reverence and awe is, Lord, you are sovereign. You are everything. You deserve my attention. Have everything. It doesn't matter what Gary thinks of me. It doesn't matter what the person up the back thinks I look like. I'm just here to please you, Lord. I'm here to worship you. And I'll do it with my hands. I'll do it with my mouth. I'll do it with my body. I'll do it however I can. Anything I can do to worship you, I want to worship you. Let your flame burn brightly. Amen? Amen. People need to see our excitement and they'll be drawn to it. They'll be drawn to it. Number seven, spread the fire. Spread the fire. When dry grass touches a flame, it too becomes a flame. It just goes. Make a point of seeking out dry places and people around you. Be generous and loving and servant-hearted. Spread enthusiasm and passion for God. By sharing your passion... And by serving others, you'll keep your fire burning brighter than you ever imagined possible. And at the same time, you'll set others alight. When we focus our attention on things outside of ourselves, it transforms us. When we look to serve others, when we look to help other people, when we look to share the gospel, something in us changes. Something in us reignites something in us drives us and that something is the holy spirit because that's what you were created for if the musicians could come and join me romans 12 verse 9 to 13 love must be sincere hate what is evil cling to what is good never be lacking in zeal but keep your spiritual fervor serving the lord Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. We need to work hard and be intentional about keeping this fire burning bright. You are special. You are called and you are chosen. He loves you so much. And holds you in such a place of value that he made the ultimate sacrifice for you. So that he can have relationship with you. And so that you can have eternal life with him. That's how much he loves you. He sent his only son. That's how much he loves you. He wants us to spend eternity in paradise And in my estimation, that's something to be overly excited about. That's something that should be keeping our flame burning brightly. I want everyone to stand to their feet, if that's okay. I am personally so thankful and so grateful for my salvation that I want to tell the world. I want to shout it from the rooftops. 
I don't want there to be any question from anyone ever whether I'm hot or not. I want everyone to know that I'm on fire for God, that I am sold out to Jesus, that he is the flame that keeps me burning bright. We need to make it our mission in life to tell our friends and tell our loved ones the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, it needs to be our mission to tell strangers in the street, everyone and anyone. We need to be telling everyone that there is a God that loves them so much that he wants to transform their life, that he wants relationship with them. If he can take you and he can take me from lost and broken and in a dark place and set us alight, he can do it for them as well. We get the opportunity to tell people what he has done for us and in us. That through an amazing relationship with Jesus, that we've gone from wandering through life aimlessly to living a life of destiny and purpose. We need to we get to stand up and make declarations of faith. On the screen, I'm going to put up a couple of declarations. In a moment, we're going to read these aloud because we are on fire for God. These are declarations of what he has done for us and who we are. Are you with me? In three, two, one. I am a child of God. I am redeemed. I am justified. I am called. I am set apart. I am more than a conqueror. I am chosen. Again from the top. I am a child of God. I am redeemed. I am justified. I am called. I am set apart. I am more than a conqueror. I am chosen. I am chosen. I am chosen. Needs to be on a post-it note, on the mirror, in your bathroom. Needs to be on a post-it note, on your steering wheel. You are chosen. He chose you on purpose. He called you on purpose. He didn't make a mistake. He didn't pick the wrong person. The letter didn't go in the wrong mailbox. He called you on purpose, for a purpose, and it is to be on fire. To be on fire for God. To be on fire for God. Heavenly Father, Lord, with every person here right now, who's standing to their feet, who's made a declaration of who you have created them to be, Lord. I pray, Lord, a blessing, an anointing from heaven right now, Lord, that fans into flame every spiritual gift that you have given, Lord, that brings out every evangelist, Lord, every teacher, every apostle, every prophet, Lord, every shepherd, Lord, every pastor, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Fan into flame everything you have created each one of these people to be. Lord, give them a boldness, Lord. Give them words to speak, Lord. Let every verse that they've ever heard or read be recalled to mind and put into application. Lord, let everywhere they go, Lord, as they brush up against the dry grass, let that be set alight, Lord, because they see Jesus in each and every person in this room. Lord, I pray that this church is a fire in the city of Armadale that people can see from all all over the place. Let the prophetic words spoken over this church come to pass that people will be looking in from all over, seeing a bright light for Jesus burning in this place. Lord, I pray that we not only share the gospel, but we walk it out. That we are transformed by your word and by your Holy Spirit. That there is an excitement inside of us that is uncontainable, Lord. That we are carriers of good news. That we are carriers of the gospel. That we are conjured 
conduits from heaven and that we are pleasing to you, Heavenly Father. Lord, if there is anything that is holding back any one of these people in this room, I break it off with the power and authority given to me in Jesus' name. I break it off right now. Lord, I loose favor. Lord, I loose power, Holy Spirit power on each individual in this place from the tips of their toes to the top of their head. Let them be overflowing with your goodness, Lord. Let your word be bubbling up on the inside. Let them be pumping out favor and goodness in all that they do. Oh, Lord, have your way in this place. Let your power be so evident. Let your word be on our lips. Oh, Lord, you are amazing. You are amazing. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. If you're here today and you haven't met this God I'm talking about, maybe you've met God or you thought you did. Or maybe you've never even thought about making a decision to follow Jesus. But today I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that, to make a stand today, to not leave the same way you came in, but leave on a new mission with a new purpose, to follow Jesus. Romans 10 verse 9 to 15, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. My friends, in the house today, there is good news. So with every eye closed, every head bowed, giving opportunity, it might be a time for recommitment. You might say, listen, I believe, but I haven't been living how it should be and today I want to make a difference I want to make a change or maybe it is your first time actually saying I'm putting you first Lord so no one's looking around like I said don't be self-conscious be God focused if that's you today and you need to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart then all I want you to do is just quickly raise your hand I just want to be able to pray for you I'm not going to call you out the front or anything like that yes I see that hand fantastic And that hand there as well. So good. Love that. Yes, and that hand. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Is there anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right, together we're going to pray. I'm just going to ask you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, from this moment on, I put you on the throne of my life. I believe in my heart and I'm confessing with my mouth that you sent your son to die on a cross for me. So now I promise to follow you and to honour you all the days of my life. Set me aflame, fill me with your power and send me to share the good news. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give God a clap of praise?